Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmeltzley. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot. Today, we're going to hear from one of the ultimate marketers about the ultimate marketing engine. But first, please let me remind you that I crave your feedback. I want to hear if you like or don't like these episodes. And of course, I always appreciate if you share them. And you can do that by going to Twitter. Every new episode gets tweeted or on Instagram. Just check out Funnel Reboot. And of course, you're always welcome to also share an episode on the show notes page of our website, funnelreboot.com. Let's go to today's show and an announcement that will immediately follow it. How would you feel if you picked up a book about work? And in the first few pages, it tells you that one of the core principles your whole profession holds dear is flat out wrong. Most cases, that would be grounds for slamming the book down and never going back to it. But when the book comes from the best-selling author of 10 books on the subject, you might read on and hear him out. And that's what I did with a 2021 book by today's guest, who's also a keynote marketing speaker. He's a husband and the father of four grown children and is a native Missourian. As he consulted for small businesses there, he became known for approaching marketing pragmatically, something many Midwesterners are known for. Thus, you have the origin of his 2006 book, which takes that same attitude. It's called Duct Tape Marketing, which has come to embody his blog, his podcast, and his whole philosophy. It also shows how well good brand names stick. You're going to hear him tell what most of us haven't grasped as the goal of marketing and the steps his book uses to help us get value out of our craft. I guarantee you that you will get value from listening to him, whether you're a business owner who wears the marketing hat part-time or you're a veteran career marketer. Let's go hear from the one and only John Jantz. I'm very glad to welcome John Jantz. Welcome, John. Hey, thanks for having me, Glenn. I'm really glad to have you with us. And we're going to be talking about a book that you put out in 2021 called The Ultimate Marketing Engine. Uh, Can you just tell me, you begin the book with something that is (laughs) quite radical. Um, Mm -hmm. You begin in the first couple of pages by telling us that we shouldn't be going after customers. (laughs) Um, Can you please tell me, what is this central belief that you want to correct that yeah. people ha- are getting wrong about customers. Well, so it really it really lays in kind of the first paragraph I think I talk about, you know, I give people a definition, what is the ultimate marketing engine? The ultimate marketing engine is a successful customer. So that that idea runs throughout the book. In fact, that's the the, the main thesis of the book. But uh, what you're alluding to is that I also say, but you can't make every customer successful. And I think that that's really the the challenge. You know, this book is broken up into five steps. Uh, One of the steps is to narrow the focus of your marketing to the top 20% of your current customer base. So that's really the idea is that, that, you know, there's probably uh, the, the, they're the top 20% of your customer because they're profitable uh, because they probably had the right problem or the right need. Um, they were the, had the right mindset. I mean, you can actually deliver value to them. So they're getting value. They're probably the ones that are referring you already today. So my, my idea in this is that, I'm not necessarily saying chuck the rest. (laughs) I'm just saying, what if you focused your messaging on attracting more of those profitable, you know, happy (laughs) evangel, you know, evangelizing type customers? Because what I've discovered is that that those people you're probably delivering a lot of value to, and they that some percentage of them are saying, "What else can you do for me?" Uh, could, right. you know, what what and th- and that's really a big part of this book too is that we want to scale with our customers and you know some some even smaller percent might be saying hey I'll do I'll I'll buy anything you offer me <laughs> you know because I I trust you so much I value our relationship so much so the the real idea behind this is that maybe in some cases we're wasting time on those less profitable maybe even 
clients that we can't really even serve that well, who are probably not going to have a great experience. And what, what that's costing us, you know, maybe it's today's dollars we're getting, but what it's costing us is the ultimate uh, ability to do 10 or 100 times more with those folks that, that already trust us. Right. And I, I love that. It, it seems like double-ended. And so often we you know, get stuck inside of our own heads and we think, okay, well, I have to do what satisfies, let's say, my bank account. Um. <laughs> well, and, and, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But, but what happens is a lot of people in an effort to not, um, you know, cut anybody out, like, you know, not make any sort of here's who we can help, you know, kind of statement yes. is – you don't really attract anyone. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, people say, Oh, you're a marketing consultant. I need marketing. Okay, sure. You know, what, you know, how cheap can it be? Right. <laughs> um, yes. and, and by saying, here's who we, here's who we can add value to quickly. Here's exactly who we help. Here's exactly who we have experience uh, working with. All of a sudden those people that say, well, I'm not that, <laughs> you know, don't waste your time. <laughs> um, and those people that say, Oh, Finally, somebody who gets me, who understands what I need, I'm actually willing to pay a premium to work with you because you clearly um, are exactly what I've been looking for. And and it's that, you know, what is behind door number two? Uh, yeah. How much are they willing to pay? You point out that if we go with the mindset that a customer is only worth so much to us yeah. and we don't go to the bother of slicing more finely within our customer base who could be worth a lot more, we will never find those ones who say, I'd be willing to pay you 10 times exactly. the amount that you exactly. currently charge me. Yeah. If, yeah. If, you, if you just looked over in my direction. Yeah. And I, and I think the other thing that happens so often is, you know, that, that mentality of, Hey, you know, they said they'd pay us. So they're a customer is we're taking business that we're probably not that good at serving. <laughs> we're taking right. business that, Maybe, you know, I, I tell this kind of absurd story in the book about, um, you know, a, a company that focuses on small business, you know, marketing, uh, i.e. myself, um, who, who then gets this lead from, you know, somebody at a Fortune 500 department of a Fortune 500 company who wants you to go through this RFP process and all this vetting in. And you, you spend all this time thinking, oh, that's going to be a great opportunity. But you you really don't uh, you you don't realize how much that's costing you to to even bid that work <laughs> yes. because it's not in your it's not in your zone of genius it's not in your you know what your value proposition um, and that's where I think uh, we really get scattered is in some ways we're just trading dollars you know it's like we we you know we expend all this effort to go get that business and yes. it costs us with our existing clients who you know or who already trust us so. That's yeah. really, you know, a lot of times I think when people are looking at who would be a good client, they're thinking, what's the opportunity for me, um, you know, in chasing this business? And uh, one of the points that I really try to drive home, and when people get this, you, you can see them kind of going, oh, I hadn't really thought about it that way, is we ought to be thinking about going after who we can actually deliver <laughs> the most value to uh, yes. the fastest. Um, there's a certain type of small business customer that comes to us that I can tell after five minutes. You know, this is somebody I can help immensely right away. <laughs> um, they're going to get a tremendous amount of value if we just tweak a few things here. They're going to be a happy customer. They're going to be a profitable customer. They're going to come back for more. They're going to tell their friends. So, so if we kind of take that mentality of you know who we can deliver value to, and and really focus on them, you know your your relation your your client engagements are going to be uh, almost guaranteed <laughs> to be successful. Yes. So you've whetted our appetite, right, for understanding um, who we turn away and who we yeah. maybe, you know, focus towards. Um, and I think that that's rather important. If we think in a marketing vein, you know, you wouldn't want to put up every single type of business you chase as a page on your website. You know, at the end of the day, your website would look like a real hodgepodge. Well, well, and and trust me, people do it. Uh, we, <laughs> right. We had, well, we, we had a waterproofing company, basement waterproofing company that we worked with. And I think I share that story in the book. I sometimes forget, you know, I, I wrote this book two years ago so now. Yep. <laughs> so I sometimes forget, but um, that, that did just that. I mean, they, they, they made 90% of their money and their profit in, in just straight up waterproofing basements. Um, and yet, 
their homepage listed 27 things they could do, uh, you know, for people. And, and so, you know, when we stripped all of that away and said, we are the most awesome business at doing basement waterproofing, all of a sudden their phone was ringing off the hook for people that were just looking for that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now in the case of, let's say a B2B context, yeah. um, it, it's a little bit further away. It's not tons, but this is, I think what your point about having a framework within the book and yeah. I need to point out that there is a ton of different templates and uh, exercises that yeah. someone is going to be asked to do if they yeah. pick up, pick up this, this little volume. Uh, those, am I right that what you're trying to do is you are trying to get the person who's developing the business to work their way towards how that satisfaction with the client yeah. can be, you know, identified and then quantified. Is that what we're trying to do? Yeah, there's a a tool that I introduce in this that I call the customer success track, and and that is a a framework that suggests your best customers probably come to you in a certain stage, uh, certain characteristics, certain problems. I mean, that's how you recognize them. I mean, that's how you know that you can help them, right? Because you've seen those problems, you've seen a business or you've seen a person in the, with those characteristics. But what most businesses do is they say, okay, here's what we sell. I delivered that to you. Thanks. Um, you know, come back next time you need that. Um, yes. And what I suggest in this book is that if you can fix that problem, what's next? I mean, what's what's ultimately, where does your customer want to go? You, you know where they are today, but where do they ultimately want to go? So, so for example, in marketing, you know, most people come to us, say, in, in a foundational stage. I mean, their website's not quite doing what they'd hope it would. Um, they don't really have a grasp on how to use content. Um, maybe SEO is a little foreign still, or they've wasted a lot of money on it. Well, when we get that foundation fixed, I mean, they come to us wanting leads. Um, but what we have to what we have to demonstrate to them is that we have to fix that foundation first. We have to develop a strategy first, and then we can actually start generating leads that will be useful. You know, yes. that will convert. So, so what we can do is we can say, look, you're in this stage. Here are the milestones we have to accomplish. If we accomplish those, here's the promise. Um, and we have five stages all the way to that business that is. Got monthly recurring revenue, steady growth. The the owner of the business is actually thinking about how to set up processes and systems so that that they might be exitable one day. Well, that that business came to us, you know, needing fixes on their website, um, and ultimately we take them through those stages. Now, we learned that you know just from experience. I mean, I, my goal is to to keep a customer for life, and the way you keep a customer for life is is to set that expectation. That, that, you know, in the sales presentation, yes, these, this is the problem you want to fix today and we're going to do it. It's going to be awesome. But here's where, you know, here's the roadmap for where we, where we could go. Um, do you want to work with us for years? Right. Um, and, and so this idea of, of taking a customer from where they are today to where they want to go, you know, really becomes uh, the mission for our business. Uh, it becomes how we develop, uh, you know, messaging, it, it, it changed how we hire, you know, who we hire, how we delegate. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, my, my real goal, I, I mean, if, as you said, if anybody gets this book, um, you'll find there's a link in there for all kinds of resources. You're all, everything I'm talking about, we've created tools cause we, we use these every day. But my real goal with this is, I mean, you'll have the whole marketing roadmap. If you've got a business that <laughs> needs to do marketing, you're going to understand marketing better than you ever have. But my real goal is that I think almost any business, certainly B2B business, certainly uh, service businesses, um, can take this idea of developing a customer success track with their customers so that they can continue to, to attract that ideal customer, but also have a, a, a complete competitive you know, differentiator of, of you know, where they're taking their customers and how they view the customer relationship. Very well put. There's a part here, though, that I'm not sure a lot of people would believe should be in the in the middle of this when you're trying to figure out uh, who you are but you are quite adamant about it and it comes down to values and you yeah. talk about i think you give a story where you started to work with a customer and this is you know you kind of preempt this you you put this early in the yeah. stage of you know figuring out how you're even going to get that first win with them but you didn't in the case of this customer find that you respected them at all and you said, I couldn't, I did not believe that I could serve or that I wasn't sure I could help. And 
you said that that was a real defining moment because you're about to get into something where you're binding your business's fate right. together with their business. Yeah. Right. But if you're missing each other on values, it's better to actually stop it there or to at least if you're doing this on paper as an exercise to say, I will not take business like this. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, th there's no question. I mean, you have to understand, you know, it's really easy as entrepreneurs. I mean, I, I you know, in a written book, it's, it, you know, everybody, every author makes it sound really simple. But, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, it's, it's very, I mean, we're chasing business. Especially uh, it's in our instinct to say yes. <laughs> exactly. And, and, we, and so consequently, it's easy to kind of get knocked off of your path. And so I think there is a bit of self-awareness. There is a, you know, experience will be a great teacher. I mean, you'll, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, when I'm working with somebody who's just getting started, you know, rather than tell them you should pick this niche or you should go this direction, it's you kind of got to go out there and experience, you know, go out there who you think will be a good customer and trial and error will tell you, you know, over time, if you pay attention, what's not a good relationship, you know, types of businesses, maybe even industries that, that you shouldn't be working in or, or just are not a good fit for you. But but but, you know, by paying attention you know, by trying to at least take this idea of I'm going to figure out who my top 20% of my customers are, you know, I think you, you do, uh, you know, stay out of some of those engagements that, uh, you know, that maybe aren't a good fit because, uh, you know, anybody who's had a customer that's just a nightmare customer, you, you know, it's just not fun. I mean, if, you know, there's some businesses that, you know, I work with a lot of marketing consultants who, you know, six, eight clients is all they're really working with at one given <laughs> one time. And if you've got one or two bad ones, I mean, it just, it makes the whole thing not very fun. Yeah, um, it can upset and, the apple cart. Yeah. And so a lot of that, you know, I, I, there's a framework that I introduced in this called the marketing hourglass, which is really kind of my version of the customer journey which I suspect you probably were going to talk about because I do spend a lot of time on it in the book. And it, and it, it, uh, it has seven stages, no like trust, try buy, repeat and refer. And, you know, most people, um, focus all their attention on no, like, how do I get people to know that I'm out there, which obviously you have to, um, but then it's like, okay, how do I get them to buy? Um, and, and by skipping that like and trust stages, um, that I spent a lot of time on you, well, that you run the risk of really attracting, uh, customers that are not ideal because part of your job as a marketer is to teach somebody what an ideal customer looks like, teach who you can actually add value to teach why they should expect to pay a premium to work with you. And if you skip those steps, you know, that's what you, where you get the tire kicker. That's where you get the people that just want to deal. You know, that's where you get the people that, you know, just aren't a good fit for your business, even though they may, you know, have some of the characteristics that, you know, that make a good customer, you've got to spend time, uh, you know, really helping them understand. I mean, for, for in, in our business, um, you know, if you spend any time with me at all, you'll hear me say strategy must come before tactics. Yes. You know, everybody that comes to our business who says, I need a website. We say, yes, you need a website, but <laughs> we're going right. to start developing a strategy. So we know what that website should do and, and how it should function. And, and, and so, you know, we spend a great deal of time teaching people why strategy is so important. And, and if you don't want to sit for that uh, component, you're probably not going to be a good fit. In fact, we you know, we've gotten to the point where I can say we won't work with you, yes. um, you know, which obviously that comes, you know, with, with time and experience and, you know, some level of, um, you know, the market realizing that they want to work with you. You get to say, look, we know what's going to get you a great result. And and if, you know, if we don't set that expectation, then we're going to uh, we're going to both have uh, a bad um, relationship or a bad engagement here. Well, it really turns the competitor thing on its head instead of sure us, does. you know, being fixated with what other competitors are saying to take what you said to its logical conclusion you might even say to somebody go talk to joe joe's a better fit for you right. by the sounds you of it right you bet. yeah and we and we we do that quite often i mean there's certain it just it's just our, my business model. We have never had the success working with straight up e-commerce companies, retail companies, restaurants, you know, so, so, you know, we get those uh, just in the common, you know, lead generation, you know, some of those show up and we, we do tell people that, Hey, I, you know, here's somebody I think, you know, is more suited to work with you rather than us chase. We get, very, very large companies that come to us and want us to do some specific, you know, thing in marketing for them. And, you know, that's not a fit uh, for us as well. I mean, it, it, it sort of all uh, rests in the fact that 
who we do want to serve, our ideal customer, the the market is immense. <laughs> I mean, there's no yes. shortage right. of you know small to mid sized businesses who want to install a marketing system, and so you know we can be. I, I'm not even saying we can be picky. I mean, we can, we can just we can uh, know and admit to the world that here's who we can deliver a lot of value to, and here's who we can. Yeah, and and you're helping. I mean, bring out if we even think about let's let's look at a kind of a, a smallish firm, but let's imagine that the person picking this up. Yeah. Uh, actually has marketing in their title. You bet. And so, you know, you're in a, a company of maybe, I don't know, a dozen, you know, 15, 20 sure. people. So the things that you just said there, you know, there's a couple of really important points that that person needs to have so that they can, uh, I suppose, be successful in their job. Yeah. Now, you number bet. one is you, you know, pointed out in your own company's case that you don't chase Fortune 500. Yeah. And, you know, a marketer may have, you know, the person who hired them come to their <laughs> desk, wrap their knuckles on it and say, yeah. you know, we, we don't have enough fortune 500 customers, right. you know, in your case, you know, after you've done the homework and looked at who you've served, you're saying that's correct. But there are <laughs> millions of businesses exactly. underneath exactly. that 500 that we do serve. So, you know, that's an important one from a, a market survey a perspective. A but absolutely. And and one of the processes that I try to uh, get people to help them narrow their focus to that and understand who they get the most value or who they deliver the most value to is I, I actually get them to rank their customers by profitability. Uh, not just revenue, but, you know, profitability. Then we right. start saying, okay, which of these businesses refers business to you already? And they start identifying some of them. And it, you know, quite often becomes very clear um, the characteristics of their their ideal customer or ideal engagement or ideal problem, you know, whatever it is right. that, that however they want to benchmark it. Um, but it, it, you know, it, it's, you know, the 80-20 rule is very cliche, but it's cliche for a reason because yes. it is quite often very true that that many businesses I've worked with over the years, that top 20% usually represents north of 50, 60, 70% of their business and their profits. Um, and so helping them really understand and get clear on who they are helps them align their message to, to attract more of them. But I think also helps them understand, you know, uh, we need to start discovering how we can do more business, you know, with those clients that we already have. That's right. Taking that same marketer, would you say that Yes, they should, you know, pull those profitability numbers. Yep. But would you say that they should even, you know, it could be eye-opening them for them to walk down the hallway to sales or to get over to customer service and, yeah. you know, have them say <laughs> what their perspective is on those customers that the marketing people at the front end of the funnel are are trying to bring in. Yeah. You know, they might they might be surprised. Yeah. Well, no question. I mean, one, I spend a lot of time when I do work with with mid-sized companies that have that marketer, that sales head of sales, that you know head of customer success or service, and and the 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 beauty of our marketing hourglass is is just that it you know a lot of people have this funnel idea that stops when somebody becomes a customer. Yeah. Um, I turn that metaphor over and say, well, l let's flip that funnel over now. Uh, that creates the, the the hourglass shape if you think about it. Um, the the two funnels together that after somebody becomes a customer or as they're becoming a customer is is really where the the business is going to thrive or or or, or grow. Um, and so naturally, you know, no like and trust for me is that's marketing. If you think about yeah. it, uh, that's their job. <laughs> um, try and buy uh, that sales job and then repeat and refer is quite often uh, customer service, customer success's job. Um, and so just by throwing that framework out there and saying, what happens here? Because I, I tell you where people get let down is it, it's the handoffs, right? I mean, so yeah. marketing makes this amazing promise and then sales, and I'm not picking on sales, but, you know, I see it all the time. Sales doesn't follow up the right way. Or once somebody says yes and uh, and wants to become a customer, the handoff to customer success is fumbled. Um, and so by by looking at this end to end customer journey, you know, just fixing those gaps um, in the experience um, is is, you know, how you kind of bring all three of those departments together. Yeah. And sometimes it's as simple as the metrics that they're each measured by are at loggerheads with each other. You bet. You bet. So you it's bet. important to kind of hash that out. You you may find out things about your own business that need fixing, you know, yeah. as, as you dredge the harbor looking for more customers and more of the right customers. Yeah. 
Yeah. Let's let's continue down to the bottom of the hourglass on referrals. Uh, you make um, an important point about it, and I know that you've actually written a book before just <laughs> on referrals. I do. So yeah. you're pretty passionate about it. Uh, I guess there are some misconceptions that you're trying to bust in the book. Uh, we we often think that what I have to do to get a current client to refer me is browbeat them to right. to do it. <laughs> you don't say that. You actually say that it's uh, the phenomenon of getting referrals all drives on getting ways to be referable, right? So yeah. again, it kind of it points back to us. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. So the, the book you mentioned, The Referral Engine, um, uh, I wrote 10, 12 years ago. Um, and the, if you go on Amazon today, uh, it is a very, very highly reviewed book. But there are a few two-star reviews that say, this book isn't even about referrals because I do spend the first half of the book saying, you know, referrals don't happen necessarily because you asked. Referrals happen because people had a great experience when they became a customer, you know, right. after they became a customer. It happened way earlier than I think most people think. Most people, to your browbeating point, it's like, oh, we got customers, let's go ask them to refer us. Um, and, and referrals happen, you know, as sort of a happy accident of you being referable. Now, having said that, um, I spend, you know, the, four, the, the fifth step in this five step book in the ultimate marketing engine is really kind of more of an evolution of my thinking on referrals. Um, and it's, you know, the, the, the name of that step is to scale with your customers by serving their entire ecosystem. Um, right. One of the things that, um, you know, I've done survey after survey about referrals with small business owners. Texas Tech just did a recent one. They they surveyed 2000 consumers and and 86 percent of them said, yes, we have a business or a number of businesses we love. We would happily refer. We talk, you know, would happily talk about only 29 percent of them actually did. <laughs> so there, there certainly is a huge gap in your referability in many cases and, and your actual ability or your actual intention to generate referrals. So a lot of what I'm talking about doing is closing that gap. Um, and, and certainly your customers, you know, are a great place to start. I mean, you probably already have, I mean, they know how brilliant you are. So obviously getting them to refer you. Um, but, but that happens because their try and their buy stages were awesome. That's what, you know, that's why they come back and buy more from you. Those are the folks that are going to refer you. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, quite often that's that ideal customer. That's that top 20%. Those are the ones that are probably referring you today. So staying top of mind, uh, certainly asking for referrals, but also, um, you know, creating referral champions. I mean, if you have people that are already referring you, if you gave them some sort of special treatment, some sort of special community, some sort of premium, you know, content or something, they're going to, they're already referring you. Now you're going to supercharge, you know, that yes. activity. Uh, but, but I also spend a tremendous amount of time focused on uh, strategic partners and co-marketing and and other you know businesses who also have your ideal customer can actually in some cases be your greatest source of referrals because you know a happy customer might have three or four people they could refer to you the right strategic partner you know in my case like a software company or something that Correct. that uh, that does business with small business might have hundreds of people they can expose me to that's right and yeah <laughs> if you'd have just been heads down looking at the next happy customer exactly you you may have never seen that software company way out That's there. That's right. That's right. Uh, and you refer to it as a dance. And I kind of, if, if I can imagine, you know, you're kind of maybe the host of the dance, you know, so you've <laughs> figured out, you know, how to put the punch bowl out, how to get the music, yeah, yeah. the lighting, yeah. you know, you're <laughs> setting it. And by doing so, I think you're making yourself integral to the ecosystem, exactly. right? That, that you're exactly. on the tips of people's tongues, yeah. Right. Uh, no, but you do have to think through this. You have to think through maybe those tiers of, well, who are my more loyal or how am sure. I going to set up my calendar so that every quarter I'm at least touching right. or making, yeah. like you said, with the, the Texas survey, how am I putting out content that is yep. going to be uh, relevant and that will make sure that I'm still in that ecosystem. Right. Yeah. And then, yeah, and, so, and, and some of it's just reminding people. So, I mean, I have clients that we just send out like quarterly gift certificates and say, Hey, give this to a friend. <laughs> you know I mean? So some of it's just being there. Right. Um, so that kind of stuff can almost be automated. But as you said, those, those champion customers, I mean, one of the um, pr uh, processes that I outline in this book is that, that particularly works well for B2B businesses if, if, and service businesses. You know, if you have customers, 
that you have a great relationship with and you're providing a service. In my case, you know, I'm, I'm providing marketing strategy. Well, I'll, I'll reach out to that customer and say, look, you, you've got an executive coach and you've also got an accountant that works with you and you've also got an attorney. I'd like to go teach them about the brand strategy that we created for you just so that they will understand better kind of where you're going, what you're doing with your business. Um, and, and I believe that that point of view provides greater value to my customer. It certainly allows those other service providers to serve, uh, her better. Yep. And consequently, um, I develop relationships with, potential referral partners. I don't go into it with that idea in mind. It just happens because right. I'm doing something that is so valuable and so unique um, that uh, that they actually want more of that. They, they, you know, they, they want to work with somebody who sees, you know, that type of relationship. Now it doesn't, doesn't work for everyone. Um, but for the ones that it does work for um, a great way to develop some strategic partners. And this brings us back to the customer success Yep. templates and exactly. all of the you know matrices that you're asking people uh, to fill out because we tend to oversimplify things and we tend to not think of those things until somebody like you comes along and says sit down fill this thing out and yeah. and it'll come uh, and one of the things that you know surprisingly <laughs> half an hour into this talk we haven't yet covered yet is in depth is content, but yeah. you know, you, you have a little bit of good news for us as we're, you know, yeah. sweating over these templates that you fill in with us. What is the payoff that we can get if we're actually going to do this homework and think through these journey stages? Yeah. So, so one of the things that I do is actually map, you know, content is a great way to guide people through the customer <laughs> journey. Um, and so I, you know, I make an attempt to map um, the, your content to each stage of the customer journey. So the, the promise, the payoff, I think that I make in this is that you can produce less content <laughs> if you take this approach, because content is seen now as just a, a you know, a taxing tactic yeah. um, when in fact it should be the voice of your strategy. And so understanding the questions and the objectives that your customers have at each of those stages, because they change. I mean, when somebody doesn't really know what their problem is or how to solve it, they're looking for different information than when they are looking at you as the, the potential source to solve that problem. And yeah. so we need to be thinking about creating different content, different forms of content that, that addresses each of those changes in their questions and, and objectives at, at each of those stages. And, and that includes, of course, content after they become a customer. One of the biggest right. uh, opportunities I see for selling more, for generating referrals, you know, it comes from your content that, that you produce specifically for somebody who is already a customer. So if you go into producing any piece of content and ask yourself, what stage of the customer journey would this would this address or would this, uh, you know, some benefit, um, you're, you're, all of your content that you're producing is going to be more focused and more valuable. Well put. It's also, it takes some getting out of our own heads to do sure. this, right? Because we've been so fixated on, okay, well, what is our strategy? But this is about what is our strategy for the customer? And I think one of the ways that you made it so crystal clear for me was you dove into a couple of books and movies and you oh, explain gosh. that this is, you know, think of yourself in one role and think of your customer in another role. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So a lot of people, you know, have probably heard about this idea of, you know, storytelling in business and, you know, the hero's journey is a, is a, you know, often right. cited by marketers as the way to think about, you know, telling your story in the, from the point of view of the customer, not from the point of view of the business, that the customer is the hero. Right. And there's really nothing wrong with that. I think a lot of people have gotten very formulaic about it though. And, it, and it's yeah. probably less effective. Um, and so where I think we are today is, um, is beyond storytelling to narrative. Um, and and the, the difference between those two is, is a story is typically kind of a linear path. You know, here's how the story begins. Here's where it goes. Here's how it ends. Um, in narrative is more like a screenplay. Uh, you know, the, the the movie starts with the the fiery you know car crash. <laughs> um, you don't know what happened. You don't know what happened to the protagonist in that crash. But then the next scene cuts to when they're in seventh grade, you know, right. uh, being scolded by the teacher or something. And it's like you get drug in immediately to the yes. narrative. So the narrative is the way the story is told, and a lot of that kind of parallels the customer journey. 
you know, the customer journey is not a straight linear path either, no matter what anybody says. Right. You know, it is a very curvy, windy <laughs> path that the customer is in charge of. You know, I one of the statements that I make all the time is that with all the kind of hand wringing about all the changes in marketing, the thing that's changed the most is the way people are able to buy today <laughs> and the way Correct. they're able to find the, the companies and the resources. And so, you know, our job is really to to create, um, you know, signposts, I guess, at each of those steps of the journey, but but knowing that the customer is going to travel on that journey at their own pace. Uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, Glenn, but I, you know, I have people all the time that become customers that, that tell me they read my book in 2009, you know, and now they're finally uh, hiring me to do something. And, you know, I, I, I sometimes cringe at that because I'm like, how can I speed up the, uh, the buying you know, the sales process? Yeah. But, but that's, that's kind of where we are today. You know, you got to just keep putting stuff out there and people will find it. They will go on the journey. You know, the, the question that you answer will hit them, you know, immediately that day for some reason. Yeah. Um, and so um, that's the idea of narrative. It's just create these components along the stage, uh, but just understand that, that it's not from A to Z that, that somebody travels. Yeah. And the, we can be intelligent about it. Uh, you know, if, if that's the voice of the strategy, I might mm -hmm. be straining the metaphor here, but you know, that voice uh, appears as words on a sign. So it does cause us to think about, all right, is there something that someone who lands on this page, if they're on that page, they're there for a reason. Yep. And there's a question that they're wrestling with. Can I answer it in a way, you know, and, and I guess this leads into content upgrades, which I think are a fantastic way to kind of get them to decide if they're going left or right at that fork. Yep. You right. know, if they do, if you do have some really good content, you encourage people to, you know, take some of it, just at the beginning that's ungated that allows them to sure. kind of by looking at it say yep that's where i'm at yeah yeah i mean and then you lead them into more it's certainly a way to develop trust you know people are like oh okay this person seems to know what they're talking about they've cited examples that sound like me you know that's that's really a lot of the value of having kind of more and more content you know, the, the the nice thing is you can get as complicated about this or as simple as you want. But I mean, there are tools now and technologies now that we can know a lot more about where somebody is on their, on their journey. I mean, we can, you know, because we had, they're in our CRM and they've done, you know, X activity, we can yeah. know that they you know, want this content now and, and we can actually deliver landing pages and what and content on our website pages that that takes into consideration you know who they are and where they are in their journey so uh, you know you can take this in a very simple sort of almost blind approach and just say hey if i put enough eggs you know crumbs out there people are gonna you know find sure. them and crawl along or you can get very sophisticated uh today you know with a team of people uh, particularly uh to you know to get very very personalized about your content and and the more you can do that the more effective it will be that's it. And the, the, the maps are helpful because if we think about, let's say they reach the end of that, you know, thing they downloaded and shared their email with you. If you look at the work that you've done on the map and you look at how existing customers who are ahead of them yeah. have, you know, gone through this and how their thinking has uh, been influenced and how they've seen marks of success by what you do for them. You should think of putting at the end of that, you know, a people who are at this stage normally yeah. then move on sure. to, That's right. you know, or the next question you might be asking is, right? So we can suggest it. They may not take us up on it, That's right. but but this is where this linking together of content so that we can uh, find that right audience, right? Who look like the audience we already know we we score with, that's right, and and to get them to move along uh, and all the way through to the end where they're referring, right? That's right, absolutely. Uh, John, the, the book is, as you say, uh, you know, uh, a pretty ultimate marketing engine. It, it serves as a very good uh, way to just immerse yourself in this. Uh, if people want to get the book or find out about you, where can they go? Sure. So, so the book itself is available anywhere you uh, purchase books. I, you know, I. I love to make plugs for, uh, you know, IndieBound, you know, your, your local bookstore. Um, fact of the matter is the world we live in today, you can probably get it cheapest at Amazon <laughs> if you want to go that.
that route. There is an audio book as well as the, the Kindle version. Um, uh, I have a website for the book itself, the ultimate marketing engine.com, just the same as the title. You'll find some free stuff there. Um, it, once you get the book there, you'll come back there and, and there's a whole resource section you can enjoy as well. If you just want to figure out or learn a little more about what I've been doing the last few decades, that's all found at uh, duct tape marketing.com and that's D U C T T A P E marketing.com. That's fantastic. Well, I will have all those links in the show notes, John, and I, it's been a very big pleasure to be able to talk with you about this book. Uh, I think I could, you know, do a whole other set of uh, <laughs> podcasts with you on previous books, but I'm glad we've started with uh, this one and I'm looking forward to uh, what you're going to continue to push out. You are a great proponent for learning and knowledge sharing in marketing and you put your money where your mouth is by writing books. And I want to thank you for that. Oh, my, my pleasure, Glenn. I appreciate you sharing. I'm going to end with a special announcement. We've reached Funnel Reboot's 100th episode, and I have so many people to thank. As with anything, what is noticeable from the outside is small compared with the work that goes on behind the scenes. Other podcasters know this, which is why I would like to call out Wendy Covey, Andrew Monroe, and Kevin Deeney, who graciously hosted me on their shows over the last while. Nice to be a guest for a change, let me tell you. Each of their podcasts is really worth checking out, so I will have them linked in the show notes. Special thanks to my sound engineer, Frank Ienzi, who brings you crisp audio that at times had used atrocious equipment or was on an iffy internet connection. The audio also has all dog barks, phone buzzes, and sneezes, and even worse, removed before you hear it, thanks to him. I must give special thanks to listeners who've been vocal on social media. This, of course, is a key way that people learn about the show, and so I'm giving right back to them. Thanks to authors who've been past guests and who are sending copies of their books to these listeners. I have to thank the generous giving by Joe Polizzi, Harry Lang, Dan White, Fred Valais, Drew Nicer, Chris Hummel, Katrina German, John Hinderleiter, Allison Hartso, Janet Driscoll Miller, Matt Paulson, Carla Starr, Angelina Jaspers, Kirk Williams, Gil Gildner, Tyler Lassard, Ethan Butte, Patrick Gilbert, Felix Verlard, Ferris Jacob, April Dunford, and Michelle Raymond. Please go check out their marketing books. It's all linked through the website. And if you'd like a shot at a book, I've got good news. There will be more of them in the future. And you simply need to interact with Funnel Reboot or me on social, to say that you catch the show. Finally, thanks to you. They say that if you want to learn something, go teach it. Digital marketing is such a crazy field. I am sure I wouldn't keep up with it if it weren't for you listening. I look forward each week to bringing you the new things that you want to hear. And I plan on doing this over the next 100 shows helping you find more ways to make your funnel even better. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.